Well, in April 1984, after more than a decade of deliberation, Advance Australia Fair was finally adopted as the national anthem of Australia. Uh, I don't know how you feel about Advance Australia Fair. Um, some people love it. Some people are riled by it. Most Aussies, I think, are pretty indifferent to it. I mean, uh, is it in history's stage, let every page, or in history's page, let every stage. It gets me every time, that one. And don't ask most of us to sing the second verse. Um, there'll be a competition afterwards. We'll see how we go. Um, many of you, though, will remember the days before Advanced Australia Fair, when we shared with Britain and a bunch of other Commonwealth nations, God Save the Queen as our national anthem. That all began to change, though, in 1973, when Prime Minister Whitlam announced a competition to find a new anthem, one that he hoped would represent Australia with distinction and help def to define a national identity that was ours, one that was separate from the UK. The competition failed, though, uh, and so a nationwide opinion poll was held. Advance Australia Fair, which was actually a 100-year-old song at the time, was um, the favourite. A plebiscite in 1977 confirmed it, and then seven years later, after modifying some of the lyrics, um, shaving the verses down to two, the anthem was officially adopted. All things told, um, it was a pretty typically Australian process of change, I think. No shots fired or battles ranging, um, just some rigorous debate and a vote, and then we all got on with the things that really mattered. Uh, well, today, in our passage, we see a change in heaven's eternal anthem. But far from being something that we can be indifferent about, um, this is something that really matters. We do need to pay attention to the words of the songs in this passage. This is a change that really does matter. You might remember the scene from last week's passage. John, uh, he's given a glimpse of the heavenly courts. God on the throne, surrounded by never-ending praise. Nearest the throne were these four living creatures, one like a lion, one like an ox, one like a man, and one like an eagle, representatives of all creation. And chapter 4, verse 8, says uh, what, what they never stopped singing. Day and night, they never stopped saying... Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. But then around these four living creatures were 24 elders, representatives of all God's people through history. Each time the creatures sung out in praise, the elders would then cry out, chapter 4, verse 11, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So there's the, the eternal anthem, this song of praise that has been echoing non-stop in heaven, praising God for his holiness, and because he is the all-powerful creator of all things. That's what we saw last week. But by the end of our passage today, this song has changed. The four living creatures and the elders, verse 9 says, sang a new song. Now the question is, what could possibly cause a change in heaven's eternal anthem? You know, last week's song was so good and so right. God is holy and he is the creator, worthy of all honour and praise. What could possibly surpass that song and be more fitting than that song? And this is uh, not an abstract question or merely the poetic question of a preacher. It's this, it is of central importance for us as we live our lives today. For what's given devotion in heaven is what we as Christians ought to devote our lives to as well. And the fact that the song has changed ought to change something about how we live as Christians too. So let's get into it. Revelation chapter 5. It'd be good to have your Bibles open. Uh, and there are outlines as well, hopefully, in the building. You grabbed one on the way in. At home, you've downloaded it from the church online website. The first thing we see in verses 1 to 4 is a universal search. Until now, all has been well in John's vision of the throne room. 
But then here we see there's a problem. God sits on the throne with a scroll on his hand, but no one can be found anywhere who is worthy to open that scroll. And John is sent into a deep grief. I wept and wept, verse 4. It all seems very dramatic, doesn't it? But can I suggest that whenever there is extreme emotion in the Bible, it's worth asking why and asking ourselves how much our emotions match with the Bible's. So the question here is, what makes you grieve deeply? And would what made John here grieve deeply make you grieve deeply? Uh, Let's look at the scene in a bit more detail. Follow along with me in your Bibles. Verse 1. John sees the scroll in the right hand, or probably better, on the right hand, which uh, suggests it's there to be taken. Of him who sat on the throne, that's God the Father, with writing on both sides. And so it's, it's a very full scroll. Normally scrolls were only written on one side and sealed with seven seals. Now as Revelation continues, it will become clear that this scroll represents God's plans for the fulfilment of, of all of history, the destiny of the world, especially the judging and saving plans of God. And then as we continue in verse 2, John sees a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? In other words, who has authority to put God's plans into action? Opening the scroll, you see, doesn't just mean revealing God's plans. It means carrying them out, enacting God's plans. And then, verse 3, this universal search fails. We find that no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was found who was worthy to open it. No great angel in the heavenly realm, no powerful man or or, or saintly woman in John's generation, not even the great prophets or the holy ones of the past who lived in the realm of the dead. That's what the under the earth bit refers to. And so John weeps and weeps could it be that humanity is so flawed and so depraved that no one is able to take authority and put god's plan into action could it be that this is it that all the wickedness and the injustice of the world will never be punished and put right that there will be no rescue for god's people Now that's a prospect that ought to make us want to weep. You know, what could be worse than the frustration of God's plans for the world? Well, we know that that's not where it ends though, don't we? And that's what's shown to us next in verses 5 to 7, where we see the universal ruler, the worthy one, the one with all authority to enact God's plans for judgment and salvation. He now arrives on the scene. But before he gets there, one of the elders, uh, one of the 24 elders, shares the good news with John. Verse 5. Do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. This is music to John's ears. The worthy one has been found. And the elder here piles on the titles of authority and royalty. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, grand titles for a great ruler. Nowhere else in the Bible are these specific titles used, but what these titles do is that they take uh, language from two well-known Bible promises and they ratchet them up a few notches. So back in Genesis 49, the patriarch Jacob was about to die. He gathers his 12 sons together and he blesses each one of them and the Israelite tribes that would come through them. And he calls Judah a lion's cub and prophesies that one day a time would come when Judah would rule and be one to whom all the nations would give their obedience. Well, here in Revelation chapter 5, Here is the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
And then in Isaiah 11, Isaiah uses the imagery of stump and root and branch to talk about this righteous ruler who's going to arise in the future. Specifically, he calls this ruler the root of Jesse, Jesse being the father of King David. But here in Revelation, he is called the root of David, presumably an even greater title for this great king. And then notice what the elder has said, said uh, it says this ruler has done to make him worthy. It says he has triumphed. So worthiness to open the scroll is not merely about who he is, but what he has done. Like a great warrior king, he has won the decisive victory. And so John turns to see this great and mighty warrior king. Perhaps he's expecting a muscular man in heavy armour, Sword in one hand, scepter in another, golden crown, heavy on his head. But what does he say instead? Verse 6. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Instead of a victorious warrior, there's a sacrificed animal, a lamb. Not even a sheep, a, a lamb. One who looks as if slain and ready for the altar. But here's the thing. For those with eyes to see it, and no doubt John himself got this immediately, what he laid eyes on was a victorious warrior and a triumphant king. See, what was the great victory that needed to be won for God's saving plan for all humanity to be fulfilled. It was victory over the power of sin and its causes and consequences. Right back from the third chapter of the Bible, we see the horror and devastation caused by sin. In Genesis 3, humanity rejects God's good rule because we think we can do better. And as a just punishment, we are cut off from him and death enters the world. But it was always God's intention for a way back to be made, that sin and death would be defeated, making possible again reunion with him and life under his rule. And as a way of foreshadowing how God was going to do that, he inst instituted various sacrifices. Uh, there was the sacrificial Passover lamb, uh, whose blood was smeared on the door frame so that those in the households would avoid the judgment of God. That was what our first Bible reading was all about this morning. Uh, there was the morning and evening sacrifices at the tabernacle and later at the temple. Two unblemished lambs sacrificed each day. And there were the countless personal sacrifices offered, often a lamb to atone for sin. The punishment you deserve for your sin was transferred onto the lamb who was slaughtered in your place. And while all these were shadows of the reality to come, it was Jesus himself who would be that reality. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When Jesus died on the cross, he, the unblemished one, took onto himself the punishment of sinful humanity. He died in our place. And so the great victory was won. The victory over sin. That's why John sees a slain lamb here. And why it's not at all incongruous with those grand titles that we saw before. It's as the slain lamb that he triumphs and he rules. And in verse 7, that he takes the scroll from the hand of the father, ready to carry out God's plans. And that's why also you get those two odd pieces of imagery there in the second half of verse 6, which are both about his rule. The lamb has seven horns, because horns symbolize power and authority. Seven's the perfect number. This is perfect power and authority. And he has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the earth, it says, because it's through the Holy Spirit that he knows all and rules all and sees all. Now, all of this really challenges our usual ideas about what it means to rule and to have power, doesn't it? In our world, and also far too often in our churches, 
Rule is about looking good. It's about flaunting your power. It's why you have military flyovers, big political rallies in stadiums that hold thousands. It's about prestige, lording it over people. But Jesus triumphs by sacrificing himself. And he rules even now. He stands at the centre of the throne, our passage says, verse 6, as the slain lamb. He still bears on his body today the marks of the cross. His rule is now and it will continue always to be utterly selfless, utterly sacrificial for the good of those that he died, that he rules. That's why his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's why he understands your suffering. It's why his service is perfect freedom. As much as it may draw opposition and pressure to stand for him in our world, ultimately it's a delight to live with him as our king. And when you do find yourselves in positions of leadership at home, at work, at church, be sure then to lead like him, sacrificially and for the good of those who are under your care. That's what Christian leadership is all about. Well, the Lamb has taken the scroll. He's about to open it. And that's what's going to happen in the next few chapters, if you were to read on um, in the book of Revelation. But before he does, there is this outpouring of universal praise, which is uh, the rest of chapter 5. And this really is the climax of chapters 4 and 5. Those who in chapter 4 had fallen in worship before the Lord God Almighty, they now fall in worship before the Lamb, verse 6. And then this praise cascades outwards. In verses 9 and 10, the inner circle of God's heavenly court sings, the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Then in verses 11 and 12, the rest of the heavenly court join in as thousands upon thousands, ten thousands upon ten thousands of angels, hundreds of millions of them, sing together. And finally, in verse 13, praise flows over to the rest of creation. Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea, it says. And it's these songs of praise, in particular the first song of praise, that is given the label that I mentioned before, that label new. Verse 9, and they sang a new song. It's here then that I want to come back to that question from the beginning. What could possibly cause a change in heaven's eternal anthem? What could possibly surpass the song that praised God for all his holiness and his work as creator? Well, it's all to do with what we've just seen about the fulfillment of God's promises and purposes in the lamb who was slain. When it comes to God's plans and purposes, when it comes to revelation, the revelation of who God is, you see the cross is more important than creation. The cross is more important than the creation. At the end of chapter 4, the song had said, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created. But look at what causes praise in the heavenly courts now. Look at the lyrics of the new song in chapter 5, verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? Why is he worthy? Because you were slain. And with your blood you purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and that will reign on the earth. It's the cross, the sacrifice of the lamb that represents the high point of God's dealings with his creation, of his plans and purposes for the world. This is what heaven now sings about. See, even from before the beginning of creation, it was God's intention to take as his own people, take possession of a single people made from every different tribe and nation and tongue. 
And even from before the beginning of creation, it was his intention to show the magnitude of his love for that people by coming in the person of his son and dying on the cross to redeem them. You know, sometimes I think uh, we can think of the cross as plan B and creation as the main thing. God creates the world, then we wrecked it, and so God's got to do the cross to fix it. But the cross, that display of the Lamb's self-sacrificial love, that was always plan A. The reason God created first was to provide the backdrop for his redemption, for this pouring out of his love. Now what that means for us today is that we ought to live our life in tune with heaven's new song. Lives that recognise that great act in history. And that means a bunch of things. Uh, But I've got two especially that I'm going to finish on this morning. Firstly, it means that we should see Christ's surpassing worth. Uh, Remember that the angel's question in verse 2. Who is worthy? And the cause of John's weeping in verse 4. No one was found who was worthy. And notice the way two of the three songs begin in this chapter. You are worthy, verse 9. Worthy is the Lamb, verse 11. It can be very easy, I think, over time to become a little bit ho-hum about Jesus and about what he has done for me on the cross. You know, our culture loves new things. We're constantly thumbing our phones so they will refresh. We're always seeking novelty and entertainment, that next dopamine hit. Uh, has anyone seen the documentary The Social Dilemma? Um, it's on Netflix at the moment. It's, all, it's, it's, it's a little bit overdramatic at some points and a bit cheesy at others, but I think it does a pretty good job at showing how the big social media companies have exploited and fed this love of novelty, this crave for the next hit um, of dopamine, of, of entertainment. Now, in that cultural soup, even we as followers of Jesus can keep on looking for the next new and exciting thing. Yes, I'm a Christian and I do the Christian things, but have you become so caught up in the pursuit of novelty, or whatever it might be that you're pursuing, that you have lost sight of the old, old story? That you've lost sight of Christ's surpassing worth? In the heavenlies, Those closest to him, they never stop praising him. Their total devotion is to him for who he is and what he has done. And if all the heavenlies revolve around him, recognising his worth and his glory, worthy is the lamb, then shouldn't our lives as well, we who claim his name, Christians, Secondly, it means that we should put the cross at the centre. I said before that the cross was always plan A and that creation, as wonderful and glorious as it is, is simply the backdrop that God provided for the cross. This means that as Christians, our lives ought to be more cross-shaped than creation-shaped. You know, uh, life's pretty good here in the mountains, generally speaking. Yes, We all have our struggles and some of us are carrying weighty burdens. But generally life here is pretty good. We get to experience much of the best of life in God's creation. And during the height of the lockdown, I would um, jog most mornings down to the end of my street and then walk walk through the bush and I would sit on a rock overlooking a valley full of gum trees and sassafras trees. And I had much to thank God for as I sat there looking out over this beautiful creation. We have good schools, good sports clubs, nice cafes, a friendly community. You can now even get phone reception at Winmalee Coles. There is plenty to thank God for. It can become very easy then for our Christian lives to become shaped by this more than shaped by the cross, to become creation shaped. Thank you, Lord, for these good things. Please continue to give us good health. Thanks for the chances uh, to go away on holiday. What a blessing. 
they're the kinds of things I find myself praying. No doubt you pray them as well. Now, that's all true and good, but there is a greater truth that surpasses it. Heaven's song is no longer about creation, but about the cross. What would it mean then if I was really to put the cross at the centre of my Christian life rather than creation? Well, for starters, I would recognise that Christ's great aim is to purchase men and women for God, in the words of verse 9. And therefore, my great aim ought to be to play my part in that. People hearing the gospel and being saved, what could be more important? Beyond that, I would recognise that God's will for me and his blessing of me is not just about my life going well in the material and physical sense. The cross shows me that he achieves great good in suffering. And therefore, in counting my blessings, I can go beyond the physical and the material and thank him for how he is shaping me in hardship, breaking and remoulding me more and more into the likeness of Christ. And when times of serious hardship do come, rather than destabilising my faith, as it, as it will do, by the way, if you have this creation-shaped view of the Christian life, when hardships come, your faith will be destabilised. Rather than being dis- destabilised, if I have the cross at the centre of my faith, it is deepened and strengthened in these seasons of hardship. So is there some realignment needed in your life to put the cross at the centre? Does what you pray for, how you spend your money, your money, how you spend your time, what you prioritise, your goals in raising your kids, do these things need to be changed to be more cross-shaped than creation-shaped? There's your conversation topic uh, over lunch uh, later today. Brothers and sisters, the song sung around the throne in heaven has changed. And so should we. So should our lives be changed to reflect heaven's priorities and what heaven praises. And may God empower us to do exactly that. Let's pray. Our great God and gracious Father, we do thank you and we praise you for the cross. Lord, we thank you that Jesus came, that he died, that he took the punishment that we deserve. We thank you that the lamb was slain and that even today he still rules as the slain lamb, the one who still bears the scars of the cross. Father, please help us to live our lives recognising that he is the worthy one, that we would pursue him and his glory. And Father, please help us to pursue cross-shaped Christian lives, as wonderful and as glorious as you are and as your creation is. Father, your work of redeeming is far greater. And so please help us to live lives in the light of that. In Jesus' name, amen.